I happen to be recording this the day before Thanksgiving, and I don't think that's by coincidence. Popular knowledge of the Wampanoag, especially outside of New England, is completely consumed with the holiday of Thanksgiving and the founding myths we pour onto it and what it means to us today. The best comparison I can make is the historical St. Nicholas figure, the saintly person who existed in reality, versus our pop culture notion of Santa Claus. That's the gulf that exists between the Thanksgiving story and the reality of the Wampanoag who lived during that time. And I say during that time on purpose because we tend to view Native Americans as being static before Europeans showed up. And even after Europeans showed up, often viewed as morally superior, but technologically backward or at least frozen in place. And of course, that's not true at all. Which brings us to the very beginning of our story. Now, for all of the Native Americans living in the Northeast, this three sisters form of agriculture, corn, beans, and squash, it actually developed quite late in their history. For one thing, corn is a tropical crop, and it took thousands of years to develop breeds that would grow further and further north in more temperate climates. And so for the Wampanoag and their neighbors, this three sisters agricultural complex only really arose within a thousand years of Europeans showing up. Of course, they had forms of agriculture before that point, but this magical combination of carbs, vitamins, minerals, and proteins were not entirely ancient to the Wampanoag, but then again, not entirely new. And so when Europeans first show up, the Wampanoag were a progressing people, just like everybody else in the world. Not static, not a frozen pitcher in time. Now you might say to yourself, okay, they had different crops, but they believed the same things. They lived their life much the same way. It doesn't appear to be so. The historian David Silverman notes that with the introduction of corn or maize, call it whatever you want, depending on what continent you're on, the burial practices of the Wampanoag and other people, all their nearby neighbors, change suddenly. Now, something like how you bury your dead loved ones is an incredibly intimate and meaningful thing. So we can read into this a little bit. Before the introduction of corn, we see that the dead are buried. And then after a while, they're undug and then reburied in a mass grave with the rest of the dead from their community. The exact manner and meaning can't be truly known, of course. But the Huron had a similar practice, as well as a lot of other natives in the Northeast. But after the introduction of corn to the Wampanoag and their very close neighbors, their burial practices changed drastically. Instead of communal graves, we have individual graves. Perhaps that denotes a, a growth of individualism, of independence, uh, or a shrinking of the value of the community or the family versus individual freedoms. The dead are put in a fetal position, pointing west and covered with red ochre paint. Instead of this communal afterlife where they were shared with the community, uh, the soul would go instead on some sort of journey in the westward direction. In what little we know of the Wampanoag religion, purified from all their Christian influences over the centuries, the spirit of the dead were going to voyage to the land of the great spirit, known as Kiaten or Kayaten. And there's a bunch of different variations on how to say the name of this spirit, as the neighbors of the Wampanoag had the same beliefs and slightly different dialects, which we'll talk about. This great spirit was believed to not have any sort of gender, no human form, abstract, and so was also the creator of everything. It is believed that Kiatin, Kayatin, however you want to say his name, made the first couple and taught them how to farm maize. There was also a spirit of death called Chipi, or Chepi, or Habamok. He went by a number of different names, as those types of spirits often do. And your mind, of course, goes straight to European ideas of Satan or the devil. But even early European explorers had to note that Chipi was not exactly the evil character that the western devil would be. Among the Wampanoag and their neighbors, the name of the spirit was often synonymous with just the action of dying or the word death. So Chipi wasn't seen as an opposite of the creator, but the way I figure it more in an eastern sense of a necessary destroyer in order for there to be new creation. Think about in your own life how many times something for someone has been destroyed in the wake of creating something for yourself, not even by your own doing, just the progression of time is what happens. The Wampanoag could also call upon Chipi as they could any other spirit. It wasn't a devil to be avoided. It was a powerful spirit that could be used to your own benefit 
if Cheapy so decides to help you. But he would become represented by opposites of the Great Creator. The Great Creator lives in the West. Cheapy lived under the sea to the East. Cheapy was the spirit of the winter, the cold, the night. The opposite of the summer and the harvest and the warmth and the day that the Great Creator, of course, gave to the Wampanoag people. But just like the turn of the day into night and the seasons in their course, Cheapy served as a counterbalance to the Great Spirit, not in competition, but in rotation. That's my best read of it. And I've got bits and pieces of evidence to this notion that I'll sprinkle into this episode. You'll pick up on it. In addition to these two figures, there were probably as many as three dozen other spirits that played an essential role in the spiritual life of the Wampanoag year to year. Many of these spirits would be highly localized, as they will be in any animist belief. There could be a spirit of a certain forest, a spirit of a certain mountain range, spirits of lakes and rivers, all who could be helpful or potentially harmful to you. A common practice among natives of the Northeast was the use of tobacco to commune with these spirits, to offer them gifts, and to open a channel of communication. You could either smoke tobacco or light it and smudge it. These ceremonies were also essential into any sort of negotiation or a very serious, long-lasting trade deal. You want to invite the spirits into your conversation, into your bickering, into your negotiations uh, to serve as witnesses and to help you towards your aims if you are righteous. But the most pronounced figure in the surviving Wampanoag legend stories was this giant named Mashup. Not an abstract spirit, but a physical mountain of a man. Similar to the giants found in the legends of the Wampanoag cousins to the north, other Algonquian tribes and nations such as the Mi'kmaq people. And I know I'm mispronouncing that, I always do. Mi'kmaq, however you want to say it. But among the Mi'kmaq, their giant figure is more of, more of an atom in the biblical sense. He has a deep importance to the people of the Mi'kmaq. Whereas Mashap is central to a lot of their stories, but I suspect he was an even more important character before, like I mentioned before, the corn, beans, and squash agricultural complex moved in. And of course, the worship of the great spirit Kayaten who brought that corn. So if I was a betting man, and I am, I would say that Mashap is a very old figure in Wampanoag beliefs and was probably more important the further back in time you went. But Mashap was a huge, huge man who would catch whales and trade them with humans for tobacco. And Mashap required so much tobacco that when he cleaned out his gigantic pipe in the ocean and made the island of Antucket. And in fact, many of the islands off the coast of the Wampanoag territory were believed to have been created by Mashup, either trying to create stepping stones to get to one place or another, or as a result of some adventure or misadventure that he got himself into. Whereas some giants in the north had grandmotherly figures who looked over them and animal friends, Mashup had a wife. who was a woman named Squant or Squayuanit, depending on where you are in the Wampanoag world. She's depicted as having long hair that was draped over her face, and she would walk on her hands and knees. And the two of them had children who were tragically taken by a giant bird that nested on Nantucket. And when Mashop went to rescue them, he only discovered their bones. In the sadness that consumed him, he smoked tobacco to console himself. So much tobacco, in fact, that the entire island was covered with a fog, a smoke that will still periodically be seen hanging over the island today. The Wampanoag believed that Mashop would protect them from this giant bird and other such horrible monsters out there in the world. And yet as their cousins further up the coast believed with their own giants, when the Europeans showed up, Mashop left. And so in the records, when the Wampanoag come into conflict or worry about what the Europeans are up to, we often find them not reaching out to Mashop but in swamps. Now, a swamp is a curious place. On the one hand, in the practical sense, it's a great place to hide. If you can hide in a swamp and you know your way around the swamp and you can navigate to the little bits of dry land in it, it's very hard for someone to track you down. And so in that sense, it was a place of safety for the Wampanoag, sanctuary. There was also a religious component. Now we know the spirits of death dwelled in the water, in the darkness, in the cold. And what is a swamp? It's the exact middle world between the dry land and the humans who live on it and the wet underworld of the dead. And so it was at this entryway that one could commune with the powerful spirits 
who could help you, or at least choose to leave you alone. But we're going to leave the swamp, and we'll find our way back there at the very end of our Wampanoag story in another episode. Because you can't live your life in a swamp. And so among the Wampanoag, their spiritual leaders were called Pawas. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. And of course, the ceremonies they would have would often be called powwows, which of course is a, one of the few things about Native American culture that many people seem to recognize, the word powwow, which in old westerns, of course, they'll apply to natives living out on the Great Plains or far beyond, but in fact only have their relevance among the native Algonquian people of the Northeast. These powerful spiritual leaders would, of course, administer to the sick and perform ceremonies of all sorts on the small level for those who are ill, and then village-wide even, to um, appease spirits that might be plaguing them. And like their neighbors to the north, they would interpret dreams, and they would go into sweat lodges, and they would deprive themselves of the comforts that you would normally afford yourself in a day in order to enter trance-like states and commune with spirits. These spirits, of course, were often blamed for diseases that people had. It was either a spirit or often a curse that somebody else put upon you. That's because the Wampanoag believed that the individual had a lot of power. In fact, many sources say that the Wampanoag believed that each human had two souls, a soul that would stay in the body and a one soul that would leave at night. And when you were having dreams, that would be your second soul or the other half of your whole soul interacting with the spirit world. And so in a sense, every time you went to sleep, you became slightly more powerful, slightly more capable, and the spirits could choose to send you messages. If you could not interpret them yourself, a spiritual leader could help you interpret them. And if he could not do so, he would have to enter into a ceremony in order to gain himself a vision to help you on your path to understanding what it is the greater world at large is trying to tell you. And usually it seems like the great spirit was a remote being, a creator, a, a watchmaker, to use a Western idea. And so the shamans, believe it or not, were quite close with the darker beings, Chippy, Habamak, and all the lesser spirits surrounding them. These would be the actors in your everyday life. And if you think about it, your everyday life involves you mostly trying to avoid tragic things. And so why wouldn't these be the spirits that you would communicate with? Many of the Pawas, many of the shaman, the medicine man, whatever term you want to use for them, they only became so after receiving a vision of Chippy, of Habamak, in the form of something they could understand like a snake. And this would be an indication to them that they had a highway of communication with these spirits. Some capability of communion greater than the average Wampanoag. And so when people compare these spirits to devils and demons, it doesn't really equate. This would be like a, a Roman Catholic priest demonstrating his saintliness by talking to the devil. It's when we try to make these comparisons and we try to relate the one culture to the other, it's where we lose meaning. In a similar fashion, the Wampanoag had no holidays. In the Western sense, holidays are to celebrate things that happened in the past a long time ago that might affect us today. Thanksgiving being one example, Christmas, another example, Easter, yet another example, Hanukkah, all these different holidays. There was some event that happened a very long time ago that was incredibly significant. Whereas the Algonquian people, the Wampanoag included, they celebrated what was happening right then. New moons, the harvest, the first signs of spring. The living reality around you was your holiday, was your celebration. Living in the moment right now. Because life after all, especially before the modern era, is very short. Something to be cherished. In the afterlife, just like for all of us, could be a day away, an hour away, you don't know. The Wampanoag and their neighbors believed that the good souls would go to the villages of Kayatan, to the west or to the southwest. And if you looked up at the night sky and you saw what we call the shooting star, they believed it to be the souls of those who had recently passed on their journey to the villages of the dead. But if you were a bad person, and so having a bad soul, your afterlife was quite different. You weren't welcomed into these villages. And so you were destined to roam the earth as a spirit. In my mind, this conjures up the image of Bob Marley over the city of London in Charles Dickens' play A Christmas Carol. But it might be more appropriate to think of a deep, dark night over the, the forests of New England, the odd howls and screams that a person might hear in their village, the odd whistling of the wind through the trees. These were probably the noises and the eerie experiences that would have been associated with these less than reputable spirits 
wandering about for eternity. After your death, the loved ones who you've left behind, they would paint their faces black to represent their state of mourning. And this would go on for as long as a year. And in that year, they would remove themselves from the public ceremonies and celebrations of their village. They would avoid people that had the same name as the deceased loved one. And actually, their name became some, something of a curse. And we see in recorded history, especially when we get to a character we'll meet much later on by the name of King Philip, that if your deceased loved one was a powerful person, perhaps a sachem, so a leader, a chief among the Wampanoag, and somebody were to utter their name, it was a taboo on the level of a death sentence that the deceased loved one's family could carry out upon you. But let's step back from the world of the supernatural, the world of the religious, from life and death and beliefs, and let's just look at the basic reality of the Wampanoag world just before Europeans showed up, and more specifically, before the diseases of the old world. Things that had traveled between Europe and China and down to North Africa and back ravaged the populations of Southeast New England. So before all these pandemics came through, the estimates vary, but there could have been as many as 144,000 people living in just Southeast New England. The Wampanoag themselves being a very prominent minority among that population, numbering somewhere between 20 and 25,000 people at their peak. The Wampanoag and their neighbors, they seem to have realized that there was a cultural and linguistic affinity between these different groups. Yes, I'm of this certain tribe or I belong to this confederation, but we are more similar than people who live quite a distance from us. In other words, the Lene Lenape to the south and certainly the Iroquois to the west. And so this term, and I'm going to mispronounce this term, this term arose among the people of Southeast New England to describe themselves, their cultural corner of the world. And they called themselves the, the Nini Missenvok. And these would be a group of people where more or less you can go to one end of this territory to the other end, and people would be able to understand you. The dialects would change. And of course, the further you got away, usually the greater the difference in dialect would be. But this is the world you could live comfortably in. Again, both with the language you're using and the culture you follow. So this would include the Wampanoag, the Massachusetts tribe, the Mohegan, the Pequot, the Narragansett, the Niantic, the Nipmuc, and a couple other little groups. More or less modern-day Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and then parts of New York, southern New Hampshire, and Vermont, and even a slice of Maine. And this big long word vaguely translate to the people, or just means people. And we see this with a lot of Native American groups, not just in this region of the United States, but really in all of North America, all the indigenous people. It's, it's almost universal, where the name the people have for themselves is quite simply people in their own language, or something very close to it, like true people, or good people, when literally translated into their own language. And this is really just a symptom of the universal ethnocentrism of all people, right? I am the default person, the default culture, the default language, and everybody else is just something different that needs to be qualified. I am part of the people. So let's talk about the families of these people. Now, I know I've gone on and on about the Haudenosaunee in previous episodes, the Iroquois Confederacy, the Iroquois peoples. Now, compared to them, all the Algonquian peoples had stronger nuclear family units. In other words, where you might learn about the Iroquois having clans and the power of the clans run by these matriarchs, and basically... Your mother's side of the family had a, a great power over what happened within a village, what happened within your own personal life and your own identity. Algonquian peoples, the Wampanoag included, they had more value on the smaller nuclear family. This is reflected in their housing styles, right? As you learn in school, the Iroquois commonly lived in longhouses shared by multiple women of the same clan. While the Wampanoag had larger longhouse-like structures, but more commonly, each nuclear family had their own little house, which many today just call wigwams. And you'll see a lot of other words applied to this structure. And just like all their other Algonquian brethren, their settlements were more spread out than the Iroquois. Rather than a huddled little village behind a palisade where everyone's packed in and the clans are clearly delineated by the different longhouses, Algonquian people will tend to spread out along a riverbank, have access to the water, in some sense, you can characterize Algonquian people and the Wampanoag as having more independence versus responsibility to community than the various Iroquois people. 
And there has actually been a lot of debate over were the Wampanoag matrilineal or patrilineal? Did they reckon power through their mother's side of the family, through their father's side of the family? Not just power, but inheritance and identity, much like how in the English world, your last name is typically your father's last name. That's part of your identity now. The historian David Silverman says that despite modern native traditions that the Wampanoag were matrilineal, matrilineal, I don't know why I said it that way. Silverman notes that the anthropological consensus is that the Wampanoag had some sort of a mixed system. There was some balance between the sexes when determining family lines, who would be sachem and who would inherit what. So again, as a result, if you were born into the Wampanoag world, your inner nuclear family, who's your mom, who's your dad, who are your siblings, was more important than your dad's extended family or your mother's extended family. To your everyday life, and where you potentially stand in your adulthood in the rankings of leadership in the Wampanoag world. But you're just a baby. You don't have to worry about all of this yet. The Puritans were quick to notice and record that Wampanoag mothers seem to have been overindulgent to the European standard and overly affectionate. In other words, they were really good mothers. But you would have lived in a cruel time all around the world. A cruel time, a more primitive time, a more dangerous time. So at a young age, male or female, you would have been raised to use a bow and arrow. And as soon as you were able to, you would help guard the fields, practicing your hunting skills on the small animals scurrying about trying to eat your crops. And before you knew it, your childhood was over. Unlike today, where you can basically be a child square into your 20s. With the onset of puberty came adulthood. Of course, for women, this moment is marked with a specific event and it would cause uh, the women from that point afterward to have to go to a special segregated menstrual hut but for the boys their transition into adulthood just being the human species that we are is more vague it's more gradual and so like many cultures across the world there was a coming of age ceremony for every young man a moment whereby afterward you would treat this person as an adult versus the child that they were previous to it. One such ritual recorded by Isaac de Racers, who is very important to our story of New Netherland, involved Wampanoag boys being sent out into the wilderness to survive the winters by themselves, meanwhile ingesting various poisons to test the strength of their body, leaving as boys but returning in the spring as men, at least in the eyes of the community. And again, I'm attempting to reconstruct the pre-European Wampanoag culture uh, using the earliest sources, which just happen to be uh, the earliest written sources written by Europeans. So I'm bound to mess up at times. I guarantee this wasn't the only coming-of-age ritual. And I guarantee not every boy had to do this. Maybe something less severe, maybe something more severe. And so my last disclaimer for now is that the Wampanoag were not homogenous. For example, just because one Wampanoag village on Martha's Vineyard had a ritual doesn't mean that a Wampanoag village on the mainland had the same ritual. Or even a Wampanoag village on the other side of Martha's Vineyard. There's a lot of variety among the Wampanoag people, and even the English noticed this. The English who were notorious for not understanding Native Americans. Even they could tell that the Wampanoag had a diverse and different culture place to place. And this is actually the secret to their survival to this day. That's a King Philip's War teaser for you. Anyway, back to the generalities. As you can imagine, the Wampanoag world was full of beaches. And so they played a lot of games on the beach. These games would become community events when they would play with neighboring villages and other tribes within the Wampanoag. I may as well mention it here, but often each village was considered its own tribe. So while they might all be described as Wampanoag, the umbrella term, they also have a more local name. For who they are and so just like sports teams today you're gonna root for your home team and inter-tribal rivalries are so much better solved playing a game on the beach than smashing in heads right but let's say you're not a team player you're more about yourself well if you were at one of these games you'd usually get the chance to wager on the outcome you would bring goods that other people would want things that you could use to bet with and just like some table games in a casino today you would use the beach sands to organize your bets. But let's leave childhood behind 
Let's leave behind the games. You are a newly minted Wampanoag adult. And with that, you might take it upon yourself to change your name to represent this new phase in your life, common in the Wampanoag world and the general Algonquian world. And then commonly, you might also change your name uh, when going to war, especially if it's a particularly large endeavor, or when assuming some title of power. The gender roles were similar to the Iroquois, where the women would be in charge of the farming, the cooking, the general household, and directing the harvest. All things internal. Men were external. We see this a lot in different Native American groups. Uh, they were in charge of war, the politics between the larger political entities. But they did have roles in this internal world where the women would have them build the structures for the most part. Of course, the women would help. The women also tasked their men with breaking up the land, clearing new lands for farms, managing the forests and the brush with controlled burns, and helping with the harvest. As any farmer in the Northeast will tell you, that's an all-hands-on-deck situation. Very narrow window of time to get everything picked. And so again, you're a young Wampanoag. You've been doing your work. Everyone seems to like you. You're fitting in. You're productive. You might start to think about marriage. This would prove to be a negotiation between the nuclear families of you and whoever you're interested in. Your parents would send gifts to the parents of your love interest. And the sources seem to reflect that both you could choose your mate and then start the process of negotiating between the families, or your parents could arrange a marriage for you. But no matter where this actually began, you're going to need the approval of both sets of parents. After that, and again, there's a diversity of opinions here, the two families would finalize this marriage by receiving the approval of the sachem, the chief of your tribe, again, a subdivision of the Wampanoag, and or the community as a whole. Now, there might be some of you out there to go, well, who, whose business is it who I marry? This system seems a little backward. Well, if you're living in the United States anyway, just remember that in order to get married in any state, you need permission from your state to do so. So maybe we're not that different, right? But it would not be typical for women to change their names. But one outward sign of their change in relationship status was that once married, they would cut their hair really short and then they would wear a hat until it grew out again. As you can imagine, this would be a long period of time to let everyone around you know, hey, I got married. And God forbid you wanted a divorce. It was permissible under Wampanoag tradition. The wife from that failed relationship, again, female gender roles among the Wampanoag being internal, men external, would retain the house. So, sorry guys, you're getting kicked out. And with that came the guardianship to any children who were still living in that house. But now let's leave domestic matters behind. Let's walk outside of our house, take a look around. When you were out and about, of course, you would be wearing animal skins. Depending on the time of year would depend on how many skins you would be wearing, typically with the fur lining the inside to make everything nice and soft. This would, of course, include comfy moccasins, which many people still wear today. And you might have some jewelry. The most popular type and most desired type of jewelry would be made out of wampum, the white beads being quite common and the purple being more desirable, more rare. There's a good and plenty's reference in there somewhere. I just can't find it. Now, many think of wampum as Native American currency, as their form of money. It really wasn't. It was just a very desired trade good among many trade goods. Later, the Dutch especially would set up a, a miniature triangular trade in the Northeast where wampum beads would be used as a type of currency, really, and funneled up to the Haudenosaunee in order to trade for beaver pelts. And in its latest stages, it did become a type of currency. But let's say you were to go to your fields, to the crops that you had planted. As I mentioned before, you might see small children guarding the fields, uh, maybe with pet dogs or even pet crows, hunting out all the little varmints that might want to eat up your crop for the year. And this is where we get to the curious subject of, did the Wampanoag plant a fish underneath each pile of corn seed? This is a story that goes back to Plymouth. And when Squanto taught the men of Plymouth how to plant corn, he had them put a small little fish underneath each pile of corn seed, which has led to the notion that the Wampanoag did this every year for every crop of corn. But historians of indigenous cultures and, and other scholars have questioned this notion. Did they give up the calories they could have gotten from fish every single spring 
just to plant those fish under the ground to fertilize corn later in the fall. There are some problems with that notion. There were a number of Wampanoag tribes that didn't live on the coast, that didn't have the marine resources that the coastal Wampanoag had. So maybe the ones who lived, lived a little further inland, maybe they didn't do this every year. They wouldn't have had the fish in order to do so, and the risk-reward for obtaining that much fish would have probably been less advantageous. One theory is that as the fields became depleted, the Wampanoag would use fish and other things to help replenish, help fertilize those fields. So maybe not every year, but maybe every four years, or some sort of cycle, or there was some sign in the soil when they knew it wasn't going to be so good growing corn this year in this soil, therefore it's time to fertilize with dead fish. You know, but I see some problems with this theory, because it's, it's all based around this story of Squanto and the pilgrims. Now Squanto, under this theory, felt that the soil needed to be fertilized. But the site of Plymouth had been abandoned now for three or four seasons, depending on how you read the records. Meaning that the fields laid fallow. They were as nutrient-rich as they were going to be, considering. But then I can also criticize my own criticism by saying that maybe the soil there was sandy and beach-like. Like much of the soil in New England, it's rocky and stony and not very deep. But then my last thought on this subject before I move on, and I promise if I'm too far down a rabbit hole, I'll dig out very shortly, is that maybe the burying of fish underneath the corn crop had a practical purpose, but maybe an overriding religious or spiritual purpose. If you remember Chippy and Habamak, the dark forces that weren't exactly evil, but did represent uh, death, returning to the earth, the ending of great things was a subterranean spirit. A spirit that you could commune with in swamps, that middle ground. Perhaps the planting of this marine animal from below sea level, above ground, onto where you're hoping to make new life to sustain yourself, was some sort of invitation to Habamak or Chippy, Chippy, to be part of this new renewal of the corn. And so would be less likely to do something that would blight the crop. That's just my own wingnut theory, and if somebody else has already had that theory before and published it, I apologize. I'll credit on to them. When it came time for the corn harvest, large amounts of corn, the excess, would be stored deep underground in pits and covered up. The Haudenosaunee and the Hurad did this too. This would serve as the canned food, or the dry uh, emergency survival packs of the Wampanoag world. And depending on how moisture seeped in, uh, could be usable, edible for some time afterwards, several seasons, even several years. But let's leave the cornfields and walk out into the forests. It's only in modern times that scholars have really begun to understand how Native Americans interacted with what many Europeans saw as the wilderness, the wild, the untamed. Often Europeans off the coast of North America, landing on the shores would describe large forests full of edible plants, as if they were in some sort of Eden some sort of miracle place in Acadia, somewhere where nature was just more giving onto man. The reality is that the Native Americans in more subtle ways had been managing the forests. Imagine yourself living at the time. You're walking through the forest. You come upon two plants that look like they're growing into one another, trying to choke one another out, fighting for sunlight and resources. One is full of prickers and offers you nothing. The other one has a delicious little bit of fruit on the end of it. Well, which plant are you going to help out? Which plant are you going to tear out of the earth? Those decisions slowly ingrained into your culture and then multiplied by many, 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 many seasons, un uncountable, would create forests that were more edible for humans. But outsiders with a tendency to see providence, God's providence in things, would see this as a miracle, some sort of sign of nature that they were supposed to be there rather than the work of human beings over, I don't know, a thousand years, more than a thousand years, who knows? Two plants that the Wampanoag really valued from the forest would be acorns and strawberries. Strawberries, of course, would be something to have when times were good. It could be mixed into cornbread, flavor things. Delicious, right? Acorns, on the other hand. Acorns were the last resort for calories. If all the fresh corn ran out, and all the stores ran out, and the rivers were frozen, and there was nothing else to eat, you could grind down acorns and at least get some caloric intake during the coldest months. And with attending to these trees and these bushes, we now know that many Native American groups practice controlled burns to clear away the forest ground of brush and other sorts of things that would get in their way of making their way through the forest and reduce the chance of there being uncontrollable forest fires. Again, Europeans didn't completely understand this and they were in awe 
of when they got off the shore and walked around in the forest, how easy it was, how you could simply walk for miles and miles through the woods. We tend to ascribe these controlled burns that Native Americans did to altruism, protecting nature, guarding nature, tending to nature. But there were some practical reasons for doing this. For one thing, removing all this brush and these grown-up bushes that are thick and sturdy and hardy, it, it allowed for new growth, young shoots. The things that the Wampanoag would hunt, the, the rabbits and the deer, would have more to eat. And then also by clearing away all this underbrush, all these bushes, all these brambles, all these sticks and dried up nonsense, it allowed them to hunt those animals more easily. And of course, if you know anything about the Northeast, you know that the deer was the most plentiful game to be found. Hunting a mighty black bear would bring you a lot of prestige. But if you were a hunter and you had a chance, you would go for a nice juicy rabbit or any of the other little critters that might come within your gaze. The more game, the more calories you could bring back to your village and to your family, the more prestige you would have. In the Wampanoag world, as well as many Native American cultures around the Wampanoag, being the gift giver, being the provider, provided you with status. You could make it further in the world, higher in the world, by giving away what you had because you were able to get it in the first place. Now let's take a little trip down to the beach. Depending on the season, it really determined where the Wampanoag lived. Although they did live in villages and they did have shelters, you had the Wampanoag Confederacy, as many call it. Underneath that, you have the different Wampanoag tribes. And inside of each tribe's territory, you would have essentially a summer home and a winter home. The summer homes would typically be, be near a water source. And if you could be near the ocean, all the better. So that you could take advantage of capturing those marine animals that are just so delicious. One strong piece of evidence of this is that even to this day, archaeologists find along the beaches of uh, New England just these massive piles of clamshells. The Wampanoag would have clam bakes that lasted so long and were so large in scale and had so many participants, so many people pulling in the clams, that we're still finding the mountains of these magnificent festivals to this day. And so in the Wampanoag world, there are some good times to be had in the summer. It's somewhat debated, but there are some very early sources that do mention that the Wampanoag did have birch bark tree canoes. These lightweight canoes would be used uh, to navigate rivers and fish along them, travel along them. More famously, the Wampanoag had these large, sturdy dugout canoes, where coals and stone hatchets would be used to slowly dig out one side of a very large tree, right to the center. And with a dugout canoe, the Wampanoag would take to the seas. Of course, not too far from the shores, but they would spear fish and they would even hunt whales. Can you imagine the amount of cooperation required to hunt a whale from a dugout canoe with a spear? And can you imagine the horrific scene of if all that fell apart and the whale got the better of your group. However, can you imagine the prestige your group would have bringing a multi-ton animal to the beach? This task was usually reserved for the, the men, the hunting men. Both men and women along the coast would collect the different crustaceans and edible whatnot that you'll find in the sea. And it was the task of women usually to take the fish late in the season and dry it out and make a fish jerky out of it. What's curious to me, well, it's not really curious, it makes a lot of sense, is many of the first Europeans to really interact with the Wampanoag and their neighbors were fishermen from Europe who were doing the same exact thing. They were drying out fish, especially cod when they could find it, to bring back to Europe. It's a cheap and storable form of protein that both the Wampanoag and the English would come to rely upon. But if you haven't noticed, I've been starting small, introducing you to the Wampanoag world. Childhood, family, in the house, in the home, marriage, moving outward, 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 outward. Let's talk about government. Let's talk about the stratification of their society. Big things because you've, you've been so patient, you've been building up to this point, and you have all the pieces. And if you're a longtime listener of this show, I've talked about the Haudenosaunee a lot and the Huron a lot, so it's good to reference the Iroquois as something to compare it to. So I'll go back to the historian David Silverman for a quote. Whereas the Iroquois governed themselves through councils of clan chiefs chosen by matrons, New England Indian communities were led by individual sachems, some of whom were women, who inherited their office through the male line. He goes on to qualify that these sachems could be unseated, they were not dictators, and the amount of power that they would have would really depend upon their popularity. Because these are small communities by today's standards, a single leader really had to rely on people liking him. Or in the Wampanoag world, even her. But Wampanoag culture, despite the stereotypes of Native Americans, was highly stratified. A lot of historians have said this. So it's this exact term, highly stratified. 
the leadership, the sachemship, as we often use in uh, the Algonquian tribes along this area, moved from father to the eldest son, and then from that son to the next son. If there were no more sons, a, a daughter from a high-class birth, meaning that her mother came from one of these ruling families, could actually become a sachem. But again, it came through the male line. And if that generation of siblings were to die off, of course, now it would move on to their children. And the process would continue from a father with no more living siblings to his children, and then run through his children onto their children. Similar to how the Powhatan down near where Jamestown will be founded in 1607 set up their ruling system. And so you had to be born into one of these ruling families. And these families would marry off their children to one another. So they would become connected, much like the royalty of Europe of old. In some situations, this would cause the ruling class to become increasingly detached from the people they rule over. But in the world of the Wampanoag and their neighbors, if your sachem was, for some reason, being a tyrant, let's say, or just displeasing the public in general, the village as a whole could remove a sachem, replace him with his brother or his son, or an even more distant relation, as long as they're within that family somehow. Also, you as an individual could move to another village, another settlement controlled by a different sachem. The entire Wampanoag world, just being a small slice of southern New England, had 30 or more sachem ships among them. You could very easily, within a couple days, make it to wherever you needed to. Also, sachems tended to be distracted by their own relatives, because the real threat to any, any power that's derived by your genes are your relatives, right? You're, the people who also have those same genes, the same kinds of claim to your rule. Sometimes in these power struggles, when two people had just about equal claim to a sachem ship through their fathers, they might default to their mother's side to determine who had a higher ranking. And so it was important who you married if you were a man marrying a woman in a chiefly family. Well, if she's the daughter of the old wise chief from the next town over, long after you're gone, your children will probably have a better chance of holding on to power versus their cousins, the descendants of your siblings. And if there was a genuine disaster of the leadership in the town over, your children being descended through the female line might be next up on base. Who knows? But being sachem, of course, came with a large amount of responsibilities, especially at the very local level. Of course, you were responsible for the bodily safety of everybody. That comes from external threats and from just crime and violence within your own village. To use modern terms, locally, you would be both the commander-in-chief and the attorney general. You would also be in charge of the local welfare system, essentially. The sachems were responsible for the elderly, especially the old widows, and any orphans, which of course in this time, a far more violent time than today, there would be many orphans. And again, your ability to provide for the village would solidify your position of power. The leaders are the givers. As such, when outsiders came to trade, they would have to report to the central house, which of course would be the sachem's house. And it would be a little bit larger than everyone else's because he would have to host events. And of course he had some status. Before any sort of business could be discussed, there would be a sharing of tobacco. And along with that, a sharing of small gifts. Once the feeling of reciprocity was felt and the tobacco smoke was in the air, inviting the spirits to witness the proceedings, trade could be undertaken. It would then be the sachem's responsibility to distribute these gifts among his people. Perhaps his most important decision for these local sachems was the distribution of farmlands, whereas the Iroquois would hold the land by clan. Your clan owned certain plots of land, and it would be distributed therein. The sachem would control who got what land. As you can imagine, you'd always want more land, but you would always as a small nuclear family, would want plots near a water source or plots with better soil than, you know, down the way. This was probably the hardest decision the sachems had to make and the most time they had to spend balancing out the pros and the cons and likely a great cause for dissension among his or her people. I mean, this is food we're talking about, sustaining your family. Just imagine if your local mayor or town supervisor uh, was able to tell you which aisles of the grocery store you were allowed to shop and which ones you were not allowed to shop. Trust me, you'd be at the voting booth a lot more often than you are. And don't try to tell me that you're voting in every local election right now, because you aren't. But you would if they controlled your food on, on such a direct level. But now let's move to the next level of this hierarchy. 
Beyond these local sachems, there would be a paramount chief, a paramount sachem, one who was above the others, who had his own local territory, and I say his because there's no record of a female paramount chief, but then had the loyalty of all the other local sachems. This paramount position would be obtained through good family lines, both on your father's side and your mother's side. It would be obtained through good relations and sometimes through war, both internal, subjugating other tribes within the Wampanoag world or on the very periphery of it, or external, being a great war captain, proving yourself a good leader and people falling under you, including sachems of other villages. Now, the paramount chief among the Wampanoag in our earliest recorded history of them was the sachem of the Poconokets. This would prove to be the center of power through much of the 17th century. The title this individual would take would be Massasoit, which many of the Plymouth Fathers would refer to this person as. But that was simply a title. It meant greatest chief, paramount chief, highest chief. So as you can imagine, you would see why this person would not correct the Plymouth settlers as they were calling him the highest chief. But at the beginning of the 17th century, this person's real name is Usamanquin. I believe I'm saying his name right. His tribe, the Poconokets, would be centered around what is now today Warren, Rhode Island, and thereabouts. But in the first accounts of this man, he had a level of leadership over at least 30 different tribes within the Wampanoag. The ends of his realm will vary at different times. At his zenith, he'll control several tribes outside of the Wampanoag continuum, including the Nossets, who were somewhat of a client state, according to the historian Paul Schneider, but also the Niantic, and we'll see in a far future episode that his children were able to light a fire under the natives all the way up into Maine. That would nearly wipe the idea of New England off the map. He had some level of rule depending on the time over the Wampanoag on Martha's Vineyard and in Tucket. On the mainland, he would be hemmed in by the powerful Narragansetts, their traditional enemies, and to the north by the Massachusetts tribe. But before the Plymouth settlers even show up in the 1610s, there are going to be conditions upon the Native Americans of southern New England that would completely flip the tables, throw the dice, change everyone's possibilities. So take all the boundaries I just gave you with a large grain of salt. Normally in these introductory episodes, I get to this point in the podcast and I talk about war, warriors, bloodlust. I get really nitty gritty with it, but I'm not going to do that this time because Usamequin will prove to be a smart and patient paramount chief. Very clever, very intelligent. What that same intellect will do in a time of war, I'm going to say for his son, Pemetikamet, in a future episode. And I don't want to ruin any of the fun ahead of time. And so thank you for listening to the Other States of America History Podcast Season 3. Our next episode will cover some of the Englishmen the Wampanoag and their neighbors came across. And guess what? Falling into the theme with this show, they will not be pilgrims. That is still a long way off.